we're here with Dr. Patrick Cronin, who is Senior Director of the Asia Program at the Center for a New American Security in Washington. He joined us as part of a roundtable conference we're hosting today at Chatham House, looking at responses to security challenges in East Asia. I'd like to start by looking at the US-Japan relationship. Under Prime Minister Abe, there's been a lot of talk about reinvigorating the bilateral relationship and some very important new initiatives on the part of the Japanese government, but particularly the relaxation of the rules governing collective self-defense and talk of a revision of the new of the US-Japan security guidelines. What can we expect to see come out of that process in terms of bilateral ties? Prime Minister uh, Shinzo Abe has done more to rejuvenate the uh, US-Japan alliance and Japan's contribution to security than any recent prime minister in Japan. And secondly, there is a determination both in Tokyo and Washington to continue to implement what he has started, namely uh, the revised defense guidelines, which are going to be finished by the end of this calendar year, announced at some point in the near future, maybe in the first quarter of 2015 because of political reasons. And those guidelines will talk about the need to further integrate U.S.-Japan security apparatuses, forces, bases, uh, to deal with the domains that often were left out of the last guidelines in the 1990s, namely cyberspace and outer space. Uh, and thirdly, the guidelines will also talk about the need to make sure the alliance is acting globally. So whether it's dealing with the Ebola virus in West Africa uh, or whether it's dealing uh, with um, cyber terrorism uh, and attacks, uh, the alliance is going to be global in nature, not just uh, regional. Despite all the efforts of senior officials in Washington to bring Seoul and Tokyo closer together, they seem just as far apart at the moment. Um, does this demonstrate the limits of American power? Does it tell us something about um, the power of emotion in shaping bilateral relationships? Um, and how serious a problem strategically is the absence of a working partnership between the South Koreans and the Japanese? Well, history is made by emotion more than rationality, um, and I think we try to make sense out of it. And so it's very hard for Americans or, or Europeans to, to try to make sense out of this uh, fractious um, dispute between South Korea and Japan, two large democratic open market countries, uh, and both strongly allied with the United States. You're right, the United States has failed to bring these two countries closer together, despite strong common interest to deal with North Korea in particular. Korea, though, is playing the political game as well. And so to watch both Korea and Japan have leaderships that are playing the political games of nationalism and history uh, is somewhat dispiriting for American diplomats and officials who were hoping that they could rise above that and find ways to capitalize on their common interests. Despite those disputes between the leaders and despite playing to the history issue on the street in Japan and Korea, um, Korea and Japan have moved closer together on dealing with North Korea. They just haven't moved as fully and as quickly as the United States would like. So they are better prepared today to deal with sudden change in North Korea than they were three years ago. But they should be better still, and that's unfortunate. And as we face in 2015, not just the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II, but the 50th anniversary of normalization between Japan and Korea, it's a sad commentary to think that the Japan-Korea relationship has not even produced a, a summit meeting in the last couple of years because of this uh, lingering historical set of disputes. I would like to see Japan do more, obviously, in terms of making sure, one, that uh, there was no misunderstanding on the part of Korea that Japan accepts the previous apologies, understands that it committed crimes, um, but that at the same time, too, it wants those issues dealt with mostly by historians, not by politicians. It doesn't, you know, there's really no place for presidents and prime ministers to be debating uh, history uh, six decades ago, it'd be, and, and, and much longer than that. It'd be much better to let historians and civil society work that out in an honest fashion to try to develop a common history. More educational exchanges would be part of that. That may sound idealistic, but I think when you politicize history, it's, it doesn't usually improve it. Okay, well, on that um, 
interesting note with the emphasis on education and dialogue, something that we, we like to foster here. Thank you very much. Thank you.